So tonight we're going to work on a combination uh, salt shaker and pepper mill. And the bottom half is pretty much a basic pepper mill. Can everybody see that? Uh, and the top half is basically a little salt, sh salt shaker. So um, it's pretty much a traditional pepper mill kind of project, but a uh, little, little bit of difference here. I've, first I've seen of this particular design, but Joe showed it to me two or three weeks ago. So um, I guess the first thing that concerned me about this is that you have a fixed ratio of four inches to the base to two inches to the top. And it makes for a little bit of a challenge getting a nice balance in the shape. And uh, the first one I made, my wife said it looked like Mrs. Butterworth. So uh, I just put some pieces on the lathe and turned them and they didn't turn out very well. So I finally wound up making a sketch. And usually if you do that, you'll come up with something that, that looks pretty well. But for those of you interested in changing changing that up. Um, one way around that is to shorten the top by a certain amount and then lengthen the bottom by that same amount. You are fixed by this six inch shaft here for the overall length. But if you do that, you have to shorten this piece here by the same amount you shorten the top. And this just basically creates a compartment for the salt. So that's one way to get around that problem. Uh, the other way is actually to go get you a longer shaft. I know that uh, they sell these at Penn State for eight inch pepper mills or 10 inch pepper mills, whatever. And you can just increase the length by whatever you, you want to, to get, get the longer shaft and you're good to go. So. So you do have some design options there. I'm gonna stick with the basic plan tonight. So I'm gonna put these aside. Now our blanks. Uh, John, if you could bring up that first picture or you might be able to see them here. We have a, for the top, we have a two inch blank. And for the base, we have a four inch blank. And each one of those has a one and one sixteenth hole drilled through. Yeah, you uh, can just hold them over that piece of paper. Right here? Yeah. So each has a uh, one and a sixteenth hole bored through. And the top has a one and a half inch counter bore, quarter inch deep. The base will have also a bore through and one and a half inch counter bores on either side, the bottom being three eighths and the top one quarter. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, you can cut your blanks to size as I did here, or you can cut them a little long or to put tendons on them. And so you can do your facing. And if you're gonna bore and delay, some people are more comfortable doing that. Um, or you can bore them on a on a drill press. That's the way I did this one in particular. I just have a vise at home and I put a circ, uh, sacrificial block under it and just bored it straight through. So either way works. Uh, I found it easy in my setup just to do it on my drill press. But tonight we're going to do it on the lathe here just to show you a different way of doing it. Uh, like I said, I already did this top piece to save a little bit of time. So we're going to work on the base tonight. To bring up those papers while you're getting this up. Uh, if you just want to show the, uh, the blanks. Uh, how do I get this off without unlocking it? Yeah, just lock that. that. Yeah, there you go. There you go. This is available. Now for the for the one and a half inch bore, you need to use the Forstner bit. 
because you want a flat bottom in that hole in that counter bore for the for the straight through hole, the one and a sixteenth, you can use a one and a sixteenth Forstner bit, which I have here, or you can use a, an auger bit. I've often used the auger bit for my pepper mills, or you can use a, a twist bit if you can find one one and a sixteenth, but that's a little bit of an odd size hole. The instructions can be downloaded from uh, Penn State Industries. I believe that uh, we have a PDF of it too that people can probably link to on our site. So I'm going to go ahead. I've marked my blank one quarter and three three eight, so I know which side is which. This is one of those backwards chucks. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna tighten that up all the way. I'm gonna move this for a second. I always like to bring up my center when I'm gonna do a, a boring operation. Make sure that I'm well centered before I completely tighten the chuck up here. I'm going the wrong way again. Did you say you're going to make this boring tonight? Yes, is aren't you bored yet? <laughs> All right, it's good and tight. Now my pieces are uh, cut to length, so I don't have to worry about sizing the hole differently. So we're gonna put a chuck here in the tail stock. All right, so I'll bring that up close and see if I can turn this thing on. Now, a Forstner bit, uh, usually you want to run them slow to keep them from heating up. So I'm going to run maybe three or 400 RPM. Is this accurate up here, Joe? So that's about 500 or so RPM. You want to keep a good handle on your chuck when you're drilling because they do like to come out when you they do like to come out when you reverse them sometimes. Not real critical on the depth as long as you do get the minimum and if you go a little over it's no problem. Okay. Again if you're boring two holes you want to do the big one first because it leaves a center there in for you for the second hole. Be sure to back out every once in a while to break those chips. Make 
you get the chip stuck in there, they will block your bit right down. Now this bit's not long enough to bore all the way through, so I'm gonna wind up boring it from both sides. On the short piece, I just bored it off straight through from one side. But to do that though, make sure that your truck has a big enough hole in the back of it so that you've got some relief there. I like the way that stops. Okay. Dave, could you have used an extension to go all the way through from one side? Yes, uh, I have an extension for this one and a sixteenth that I used to use making uh, longer, you know, eight inch or ten inch pepper mills. So that is a good way to do it if you want to, if you have a longer base piece or you just want to try to bore it from one side but I would actually recommend boring from both sides because for in the first place you got to put a counter bore on the other side on this one and in the second place um, it's going to walk a little bit even though you're boring it on a lathe so this minimizes the amount that that hole's gonna be off center and it's gonna meet a little, there's gonna be a little place where the two bores meet in the middle and that, but that's not close to any of the piece that have, pieces that have to be concentric. So it's really not an issue. So I brought my center up again, just to make sure that that chucking is centered up good. You don't have to do that, but I always like to do it. All right, and this side gets a quarter inch deep, one and a half inch hole. That's a new bit. That's why that cuts so nicely. You can leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> the first one I made, I made with an old bit that I've used on a probably 50 pepper mills. And uh, it was so hot when I finished, I couldn't touch it. And this one's hot too. You basically just burn your way through. Yeah. <laughs> And I've tried sharpening them and sometimes that works and sometimes it, after a while, it's just time to throw in a towel and buy a new one. That's about the case on this one. Uh, did I touch this bar or something, Joe? What's that? I must have touched this bar in front. Oh yeah, it's kind of touchy. I got it it works. It does. It does. When you have too much spaghetti.
Here she goes. Water or something, let me know. We'll do. I'm good. Okay. Joe, what is the wooden block on your tailstock for? Did you have to repair that robust? Yeah, I actually did. Yeah, yeah actually, I did. It was coming apart, so I put this clamp around it. No, oh, it's all the laser. I have a laser line laser that sends to the center of my leg, so I can, no matter where I'm at, I always know where my tool height should be. So um, I really don't see much of a place where the two bores intersected in there. It's very light. Sometimes I get a little bit more than that. It's a little rough in there, but I, I've got a little three-quarter inch sanding sleeve. I just usually take in there and just get the rough part out so it don't get mixed up with the pepper. And that's about all it takes. So there's our blanks ready to go. And let's see. You have open your jaws up a little bit and then put your tool in there. Okay, no. There it goes. I just put that in my truck. <laughs> That's a nice job. That's the reason I board mine on my lathe because my jaws won't chuck a one and a two and three quarter piece. So I could have put it between centers and turned it around, but that was just an easy way for me to do it. There's, like all things in wood turning, there's more than one way to do it. So if you look at the plans. Uh, look on that second page. Uh, can you bring that up, yeah. John? What they recommend for a mounting is one of these expandable drum sander drums, and it's got a nut on it, just expands to fit in the hole, and they show it mounted in a chuck. In a drill they, rec shot. they recommend that because they can get more money from you. Yeah, but and and actually, I made one like that. You can make one like that, but I don't recommend it. Um, the number one reason is because these 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 chucks will come out of your headstock if you don't have a threaded a threaded hole in the bottom of your drill chuck that you can run through the headstock and lock down with a draw bar. You don't need to be putting a chuck in your headstock. Yeah, there's Joe has one here. Can everybody see that? Let me get the other camera. Can you see that? So there's a a, a, a thread in there, and you can thread it back through the headstock and lock it down. I'll just show it to everybody. Like so, and it locks it in place. But um, if you don't have that, like my, I don't. <laughs> Mine doesn't have a, a thread in the bottom. And you put this in here and you start turning on it without something to hold it in there, any vibration from the cut We'll, we'll shake this loose. And I know that by experience. So um, the way I did it on the headstock, it's long enough. This thing is long enough that you can get your center, your cone center in here on this part, and you can hold it in with the center. So that works. That's the way I did that. On the tailstock, 
it, I mean, on the headpiece, it's so short that there's no room hardly for the center to get in there to hold it. So the way I did it there, I didn't use the center to center the blank. I just used the center against this surface here just to hold the chuck in place. And that's why my center is a little flat on the end there. But uh, you have to do, if you're going to use this technique with the expanding uh, arbor, you, you really should be very careful with that. I, I don't recommend it. What we're going to do, Joe showed me a little expanding arbor he made, so or a jam chuck, if you want to call it that. So I made one myself to fit my stuff. And basically, it's just a piece of maple that's been turned to very snugly fit, so there's no play in there. And then I have a screw, I, I cut slots. Let me unlock this thing again. I cut slots in at 90 degrees and I put a screw in there, a flathead screw with a taper on it. So I can put my part in there. It shoulders against the shoulder right there. And when I tighten it up with the screwdriver, it's good, it's good and snug. That's cheaper than Penn State's option. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you're going to make a few of these, it's well worth your time to to turn your pieces like that. So let's, since I've got it up there, let's go ahead and work on that. Uh, with this piece, it's so short, I'm not going to use the center. I doubt it would pick up on that bolt anyway, so... Okay. Nobody called me down for not having my safety glasses on yet. We were going to. <laughs> All right. I noticed you don't have a mask. It's behind me. And actually, I do wear a mask when I'm roughing. I guess you can still hear me now. How about that? This uses a time. Oh, we can't see that. All right, let's raise this thing down that way. But that can slip a little bit, so if it catches on me again. It
Okay, so that's basically round. Now, I like to work to a sketch, and I think there's a sketch on the that John can show you also. Like I said, my first try at this, just by putting it on a lathe and turning it, really didn't turn out very pretty. So I sketched something out that I thought would have some balance to it. And what I like to do with my sketches, and these are just hand sketches, is on the right side, I put the di major diameters, and on the left side, I put me a, a position, number that marks the position. So on my top, I've got three quarters of an inch down. I want a, a large uh, bead, if you want to call it that, and at two and a quarter inch diameter. And then near the, near the base, I'm gonna go with a two inch diameter, about one quarter in. So just gonna mark those real quick. This is the top. And two and a quarter. I'm going to move my two. So this ends uh, near the top is going to be two and a quarter and down here it's going to be two. So I'm just going to lay those out real quick. And I usually give myself a 32nd to a 16th of an inch. And the top is two and a quarter. I'm using a badan here because it's a very efficient way to remove a lot of material. I love this tool holder, Joe. That I could take home with me. I said, I love this tool holder. That, that I could take home with me. So I'm just smoothing out uh, the surfaces a little bit. Because the badan doesn't leave a very good surface to work with. Generally, I use a 
a digital caliber. Uh, you really don't need to be this close, but it gives me an idea that I'm where I need to be. All right, so now I can lay out quarter inch from this end. And three quarters from this end. And not I saw somebody say you're supposed to sneak up on a feed, so that's what I'm doing here. And since I cut my pieces exactly the length, I'm just going to come in here and smooth that on around. This is kind of cheating, but it works for me. I need to put one more on. I want to come down to about one and a half right there. So just put a line on there to see where I am. And that's just a little, little much. That'll do it.
on a large bead like this, uh, a lot of times I just like to use a flat scraper. It helps me get a nice uniform shape and takes out some of my poor work with the with the gouge. Did you, did you leave your skew at home? You know, Gary, I have been practicing with the skew, but I'm not good enough to use it on a demo yet. Okay. So basically that's our top. I'm not gonna do any sanding tonight because you guys all know how to sand. And uh, the nice thing about this setup is I can go back. I can put this right back on here if I need to clean up my turning a little bit and I do and do some sanding on it and no problem. So that's our top. Where's the base? Anyways. The other two pieces I made, one was walnut and the other was canary wood. I could barely turn it on that jam chuck. And this is cherry and it's a little loose. <laughs> well, I guess the wood just cuts a little differently. All right, on this piece, because it overhangs my jam chuck a little bit, I'm gonna use my center, this cone center. And just slip down.
Okay, from my sketch, I want the top end to be two inches again and the bottom to be two and a half. So I'm just going to lay those lines in. Measure twice, cut once. Makes you want to go out and buy a bedan, don't it? <laughs> Already there. Okay, a little overshot there, no problem. Again, laying out my key features and quarter inch. Somewhere around here, it's going to be one and a half.
Well, I mislaid my cutoff tool somewhere. I got it. Just roughing away most of the material now. I like using a, a little smaller roughing gap, I mean, uh, spindle gouge on little small tight places like this. Yes, that's what you call a catch. I've never seen one of those. For some reason, I have a tendency to get them. <laughs> Where you get your wood. Maybe that's it, yeah, Gary. I need, need to be buying my wood from a better place, huh? Yeah, you can buy it with or without catches, apparently. <laughs> Next time we go up to wall, we'll get some without catches. All right. I'm always ready to go to wall lumber. Let's see if I got all my catch out. Yep. A little bit right there.
This little thin gouge doesn't like to be used like a scraper. All right. All right, so that's the basic shape we're looking for. Again, I'm not gonna spend the time to try to get it perfect tonight because I can do that at home. So that's the essence of making the base. Get this out of my way because I really don't want it in my elbow. Can I mess you up by moving that closer? Sorry? Can I mess you up by moving you to where I close? Oh, no, no. You know, she said your tool. You can say tool. Right <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we have our top and bottom. Can we see that? Let me get her over the truck. Sorry? Get over the truck. Here? Yeah. Okay. So now all we have to do is sand that, put some finish on it, and I'll walk you real quick through the assembly process. That goes over here, don't it? Over this part. I don't guess it matters. So this one I just have loosely assembled. Not there. Here we go. So the base part looks like this as it comes in the kit. It just slides into our slot here. Oops. This piece, this smaller diameter fits into the 116th hole and that seals off that compartment for the salt. And this larger diameter acts for the register 
in the top part. Uh, they have three holes for screws and they supply you with the screws. But if you put them in there, you better drill this hole deeper than they suggested because they'll bottom out on it. Uh, the instructions actually say to glue it in there. So I don't know why they supply you with screws, but all of them I've seen so far, they fit tight enough to where you don't even have to bother gluing them. It's pretty much in there. So that goes in. That fits in there like that. The top actually goes over that a little bit. I like to push it with my finger, gauge it. And then there are some slots down here in the bottom that you have to line up together. And we have a base piece here. We did have a base piece. <laughs> we have a base piece here that goes in over those slots and just mark that. Draw you a couple of 1 16th inch diameter holes and pop the screws in there. And that's what holds the pepper assembly in when you remove this part to fill it with pepper. So that's about all there is to it.